Hello and welcome to a uh, yet another new um, sub-series, I guess you could say, <laughs> on my um, channel here. Um, we're going to be doing bitwise homework, so uh, you might be wondering what is bitwise. Well, um, I've known for some time that Pear was thinking about doing a series um, that's Pear Bonson. And uh, like he talked about it on Twitter some like a year ago. And now uh, he has started actually doing it. So um, yeah, I'm very excited about that. And uh, I want to go over what Bitwise is. So it's very similar in some respects to Risky Business. Uh, he says here, Bitwise is a free educational project uh, about building the software and hardware stack uh, for a simple computer from scratch running on an FPGA. Uh, this includes all the system software, including operating system, compiler, etc., as well as the HDL source code for the CPU, graphics chip, peripheral controllers, all of it. Hello, Risky5. Thank you for tuning in. So, uh, let's see, does he say more about it here? Well, anyway, um, he has links here. This is uh, bitwise.handmade.network. Uh, so if you go on the Handmade Network, you can find his project here. And uh, he streams it on Twitch. Uh, so he's got a link there to his Twitch. Uh, he has a YouTube channel that he uploads the videos to. Uh, he has a GitHub where he pushes all the code and everything to. Uh, he also has a Discord if you're interested in that sort of thing. <clears throat> Personally, uh, I'm not a fan of Discord, but uh, if you like it, he uh, he has a chat. I'm more of an IRC guy myself, but um, so he's done uh, four days worth, starting with day zero, which was just an overview and Q and A. Uh, then he introduced Ion, which. I'll speak more about it in a little bit. Uh, then he did some C programming and parsing, and then more programming and parsing. So that's everything as of while well, this is being recorded. That's everything that he's done so far. And uh, here's his GitHub. So everything he does, he pushes to here. Uh, and I've got that uh, downloaded here. All right, I cloned the repository just before I started the stream. So we're going to be uh, following along. Uh, I'm not going to be streaming me watching <laughs> his content, but uh, I'll be streaming when I do homework of, of his. So, uh, so you know, let's go over the Q&A, first of all, that he did in this uh, frequently asked questions file. So um, first of all, Pear is a very experienced programmer. Uh, he's worked as a game engine programmer and systems programmer. Uh, he's worked at Epic Games, NVIDIA, Rad Game Tools, and Oculus. So. Uh, and uh, 15 years, more than 15 years of experience, he says. So he is a very uh, experienced programmer. Much more so than myself. Uh, I only worked at um, Acre for like uh, two years or so. Uh, Let's see what else here. Uh, so one thing to point out is he is going to be designing his own uh, languages. So um, he says most systems level software will be written in our own C-like systems programming language. 
which will be implemented in C99, and that's what he started on uh, already. And um, when we get to hardware design, uh, he'll be uh, making his own hardware description language as well. Um, and um, I thought he had a, a more fleshed out roadmap. Uh, I seem to remember a larger roadmap, but maybe I'm remembering wrong or something. But uh, the the kind of high level short description that he gives here is uh, a pretty suitable description of what all it's going to be. Let me just check over these other files quickly. Okay, yeah, this is what I'm thinking of, I think. Uh, here are some examples of what you will learn to build. Uh, hardware description language, compilers, and simulators. FPGA-based hardware, including CPU, GPU, HDMI controller, Ethernet, uh, Mac, DDR3, uh, so on and so forth. Um, kernels, including drivers, hardware abstraction layer, scheduler, virtual memory manager, file system, TCP IP stack, so on and so forth. Uh, system libraries, including GUIs, memory allocators, and so on. System applications, including compilers, assemblers, disassemblers, profilers, debuggers. Test infrastructure, uh, including property-based testing, directed randomized testing, fuzz testing, and so on. So uh, it's interesting because there's a lot of overlap between um, Risky Business and Bitwise. So I think these two projects really complement each other very nicely. So uh, what I want to highlight going into this first um, episode of me doing homework here is kind of comparing and contrasting the two projects. Um, and uh, first of all, going over similarities, I would say there's a lot of similarities in that um, uh, we're both doing projects on Handmade Network, uh, streaming to Twitch, putting the videos on YouTube, uh, having code available on GitHub. Uh, we're both intending to do uh, toolchain work, although his project is uh, wider scope than just toolchain work. Uh, and that includes uh, a custom systems programming language. Uh, uh, if you've watched a lot of my videos, you know that's in the plans on my channel at some point. And um, uh, he also mentioned in the um, this announcement that he might try to get uh, Linux going at some point. But he's making he's going to be making his own operating system, so I don't know. Can we find Linux in here? Yeah, we might eventually try to bring up Linux on the computer once we've implemented MMU support, but that is not a primary goal. For me, it's kind of the inverse in that risky business one of the primary goals is Linux, but um, uh, I never announced anything, but I did have in the back of my mind, uh, you know, very far in the future, we might uh, experiment with um, operating system development too. Um, now I'm thinking, well, probably I'll be learning operating system stuff from Pair with the Bitwise series and we'll uh, play around with the stuff he ends up making on Bitwise on our series as well uh, much later on. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, some differences between the two projects are um, he first of all he's much more experienced as a developer 
as I said, he has 15 years of experience and he's worked at some, you know, pretty big name companies. Uh, whereas, uh, and I think that kind of influences the way he approaches his streams where he kind of presents himself as like a teacher, like he assigns us homework <laughs> and stuff like that. Uh, and um, we learn from him directly. Whereas uh, with what I do, uh, I, I, you know, definitely don't present myself as any kind of expert. Uh, I'm the student learning, uh, self-learning with Twitch, helping out, and uh, people uh, maybe learn some along the way with me. Uh, so I'm starting kind of from scratch of, I don't know anything. <laughs> Let's learn on this stuff so that we can do, like, really awesome tool chain work, like, Let's build up to the point where we are an expert, whereas he's coming from the perspective of he's already an expert. Let's just show people how to do this sort of stuff, which is really perfect for me because as someone who's learning how to do this stuff for this series, like his series directly uh, kind of expediates the process for myself. Uh, I'll definitely be learning a lot from it, and that's going to directly you know, feed into the quality of risky business long term. So I'm very excited about that. Uh, the other thing is, speaking of how he presents his show, he does it differently in that uh, I really like to stream everything. So I do very little off stream other than like the everything that goes into, you know, running a YouTube channel and the stuff behind the scenes with keeping the videos archived on my hard drive and, you know, Twitch stuff like uh, Streamlabs and, you know, social media stuff, things like that. Uh, the actual uh, programming type work uh, is all done on stream on my channel, whereas with Pear, uh, he's just doing uh, like one or two hour streams, you know, like daily or bi-daily uh, and he says he'll do blog posts weekly or semi-weekly uh, and that's going to be very interesting to see I might want to uh, do something similar to that depending on how it goes for pair I kind of want to see how it works for him and then <laughs> if it seems like a good idea I might uh, steal it for my own show the idea of doing weekly or semi-weekly blog posts summarizing the progress what I currently do is I do a blog post uh, once a month or once every two months if I don't get a lot done <laughs> in, a, in a month. Um, and uh, the blog posts, are uh, they don't really have a lot of meat in them. They have maybe a few paragraphs of kind of what's been done and what I'm looking forward to in the coming months. And they have um, just a, a quick summary of everything that was done with links to each video uh, corresponding to each bullet point. Uh, but that's really all my blogs feature. They're not like a nice meaty article that you can read and learn from. Which is what I assume he's gonna be doing with his blogs, but I might be wrong. Uh, and when he's not streaming, he's going to be working full time on the project and he'll summarize it, what he's done since the last stream. So like he'll work full time until the next stream and then he'll summarize his changes in the next stream. So you don't actually miss anything, but you're not watching <laughs> every step of the way. So that's uh, a major difference in how he presents his show. Uh, the other small difference I would say is that um, he doesn't take uh, any form of donations. He's living off of uh, self-sustaining savings. Uh, and uh, the difference there is I do take donations. So if you wanted to you know, send money pairs way, but you were disappointed that you weren't able to, and you just, you, you want to send money to someone, but you can't send it to pair, you know, I'm just saying, I, I could help you take that money off your hands. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course, but, you know. 
uh, I am living off of savings as well, but uh, they're not self-sustaining savings. <laughs> I'm burning through my life savings. So I'm going to be totally broke after a few years of this, and then I'll need to get a real job <laughs> unless this becomes self-sustaining um, if enough people support me, which is kind of the goal. Uh, but yeah, that sums up everything, I think, kind of comparing and contrasting the two projects. So um, before we get into homework, I want to talk about his language that he's designing because that's very interesting as well. Oh, he also has guidelines and stuff, community guidelines, GitHub issues and pull requests. We're not going to read over those because this uh, that's his project and uh, we don't really care. <laughs> uh, okay, well, there's an example. Okay, here we go. Uh, Ion, a C-like systems programming language. So the goals are easy to implement, immediate familiar to C programmers, no learning curve, uh, reduced distractions, needless features, comfortable for our day-to-day -day work, uh, usable for host and target development, uh, for host, interop seamlessly with C and host OS. For target, uh, generate machine code. Don't need C compatibility. Uh, and protect long-term code investment. What he's talking about there is um, the fact that you can have a backend. Uh, he wants to have a backend that targets C. So you a transpiler. You you generate C code instead of machine code. Um, and um, he says he wants it to generate idiomatic C. And I'm very curious to see how that goes. Um, it sounds like an attractive idea. Uh, Transpiler is compiling, you know, targeting to targeting C is not uncommon. A lot of languages start that way or um, maybe even continue being that way. I don't know, but uh, I know many languages start out that way and it's a decent way to go. But when it comes to having the generated C code be idiomatic, I just don't know <laughs> how realistic that is. Um, but like I say, we'll we'll see how he how he goes about it. I might be underestimating him. Uh, non goals, best language ever. Highly opinionated versus C. Raising level of abstraction, memory slash integer overflow safety. Why C appropriate level of abstraction, familiar to target audience, ecosystem libraries tool chain. Uh, code is protected investment. So, you know, uh, I don't know so much about how true that is when it comes to YC um, with in terms of interoperability, because uh, you can target the ABI uh, and then, you know, the same ABI as C, and then you can uh, perhaps link with code that was compiled from C. Uh, and uh, if you are using a backend that produces C, then you can directly use C libraries with the, the code that's generated from your project. But uh, if you want to use something like an SDB style library or any library really uh, <laughs> directly in your project, uh, every language suffers, every language that isn't C suffers, well, unless the language supports the preprocessor <laughs> like C++, but excluding languages that use the C preprocessor, every language suffers from the problem that uh, the C preprocessor is um, a really hairy beast. Uh, you can't really, um, uh, how do I want to say this? Like you need to, you need to rewrite macros in the, in the host language. Um, so for example, in D, 
uh, you can bind to C libraries. So for example, if you want to bind to a C library, you generate the, the library file uh, for that library that you're going to link to. And then in your D project, you just say like, uh, you know, a function prototype uh, that isn't defined in the D code and it'll, you know, link that up um, at, uh, at link time. But uh, with macros, because macros uh, get expanded uh, and people can do tricky things with macros, you can't really automate the process of translating a macro into something in D. Uh, at least as far as I know, no one has successfully totally automated all the, the crazy ways macros can be used. I don't think it can be done, but... Um, that's kind of a major problem because it means you need to go through the library and everywhere there's a macro, you need to redefine that in D. And like I say, this is a general pro problem of any language uh, using a C library. So, um, you know, I think there is a fair amount of friction there if you're trying to use C libraries in any language other than a language that uses the C preprocessor. And you definitely don't want your language to use the C, pro C pre preprocessor. Like the only advantage that has is that it lowers the friction with interoperability with C but it creates so many disadvantages that it because it's such a shitty <laughs> system that it's totally not worth it in my opinion so uh i don't know i feel like he's maybe maybe kind of over promising but maybe i'm just you know reading into these words a little bit too much uh you know he's obviously aware of these things um so why not C? And I, you know, if you watch this show, I don't think you need to know why not C. <laughs> We've seen plenty of reasons, like working on pcalc, for example, of why C is kind of terrible. Um, uh, one interesting thing that he's doing in his language is um, he. Uh, he's going to stick with the undefined behavior from C to keep compatibility with C, which I find kind of interesting because, uh, let me draw this out in Milton for you guys. So what I'm thinking here, let me, what I'm thinking is, um, you know, if you have, oh, I need to, um, I need to get my uh, tablets input mapping to the property screen. Okay, there we go. So um, if you have a like compiler, basically the idea is like you have a front end and then you can have multiple back ends that generate different things. So, um, you know, say this one is like um, x86, 64, and this one is um, risk 5. So then uh, when you compile, like your source code goes in here, and then depending which which backend you're on, you'll get 
an x86-64 executable or you'll get a risk 5 executable on this back end right but in uh, in pairs language what's what we're going to have is we're going to have a back end that doesn't produce uh machine code uh c back end so what this is going to produce is a c project right it's going to spit out c files and uh or i guess dot h files too um and then the idea here is you pass this off to a c compiler which has its own backends and uh you know we'll, we'll just treat that whole thing as a as a black box here but at the end of that you get an executable right and um, the thing that's interesting about keeping compatibility with undefined behavior, uh, in my opinion, there's no reason why you really need to do that if you have platform defined behavior. So rather than having undefined behavior, uh, you say it has to be specified like each of these backends need to specify um, every bit of behavior that the 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 common stuff the common stuff is the stuff that isn't undefined behavior or unspecified behavior or platform dependent behavior none of that stuff like <laughs> just stuff that should work right but then uh there's stuff that it depends on the platform and uh, in C undefined behavior is a pretty big problem one solution is let's just define everything as platform dependent behavior and if you do that what you're saying is uh, at this level everything the behavior needs to be well defined and um, if you do that you have a few options for this back end right here the first option, uh, which if you want to generate uh, idiomatic C code like pair is suggesting, uh, then what you would probably want to do is uh, have the platform behavior be undefined behavior in C. And the big downside of that is if this backend has undefined behavior and you pass it to a C compiler to produce for example an x86-64 executable and then you compile the same program on the same machine but you use the x86-64 backend uh, for ION directly and you get an executable uh, it's possible that the undefined behavior here doesn't match the actual well-defined behavior here and so even though you compiled the same code for this on the same machine uh, you have two programs that potentially do two different things which is a pretty big downside of having uh, <laughs> a backend defined in that way but if you're willing to live with that, which in practice might not be so bad because you kind of know what you're doing, you know, you know what you're getting into by defining it this way. If you're willing to live with that, um, you'd still be able to generate nice C code without it technically being undefined in the, the language you're compiling. Uh, the other thing you can do if you don't want to have this situation where executables from the same same language compiled on the same machine having different behavior, uh, if you're not okay with that, the other thing you can do is you can say the C code, it needs to generate 
extra code to make sure the behavior, like to make sure undefined behavior is avoided. So the behavior, it has to generate a sequence of <laughs> C code that's well behaved and corresponds with what this backend would do, for example. Uh, that's the other thing you can do. Uh, where those extra sequences of code you're generating would correspond to whatever the the machine target is. So you would actually need, uh, you know, separate C backends for each machine target too, if you go that route. Uh, but my point is, uh, you don't really need undefined behavior in your language. You don't need to preserve that, uh, in my opinion. Uh, Pair, of course, thinks differently. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm right and Pear is wrong. <laughs> Uh, Pear is definitely more knowledgeable than me, but that's just my naive opinion when I look at the problem. Uh, other than that, um, <coughs> uh, if we keep looking here, he has a few quality of life things, order independent declarations. Uh, runtime introspection, fast, powerful, non-compiler tooling powered by compiler and introspection, uh, packages, convention over configuration, relies on order independent declarations. Uh, he also has a kind of a path that he wants to follow. He's going to start bootstrapping as a C99 code base, eventually convert to self-hosting. Uh, he'll start with a C backend. He's going to do a simple two-pass compiler. Pass one is lex uh, ll1 parse, produce AST. Pass two is resolve, type check, type check code gen, uh, produces C code or RISC-V machine code, uh, and metadata. And like he says, he wants to be able to generate uh, good C code without actually writing C. Um, so this is kind of the high level overview of what he's doing. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, my own plans for a language because it's very similar. Like the idea, the ideas I have for a language are very similar to what he's doing here. And like I say, I've been planning to do my own language on my show for some time. My plan was to go through, uh, I guess I don't have it here right now, it's over there, but uh, the LCC book, um, uh, LCC is a program, uh, a tiny C compiler that uh, is written as a literate program. Uh, if you don't know about literate uh, programs, that's something Donald Newth uh, kind of came up with, where you basically write a book, and the code is interspersed throughout the book, and then uh, it's written in such a way that it's uh, uh, you can take a program and run it over the the literate program source, and it spits out uh, actual compilable code like it, it strings it all together into a program and then you can just compile that code and run the program but then you can also take that original literate source code and uh, have it produce like an actual text document of some kind like a pdf or things of that nature so you can actually you know have it be a book um, and uh Using that technique, we got uh, a retargetable C compiler design and implementation, I think it's called. Yeah, this is the book right here. 
a bit of a bit of a mouthful for the name of the book, but I just call it the LCC book. And uh, we're going to go over that on the book club series at some point. I wanted to start it when we um, get to the point in pcalc development where I want to get back to adding features to it. Uh, and when we decide to actually implement the input parsing, I was going to start going through this book to learn how they do that in an actual C compiler. And then we'd continue reading the book. We'd read through the entire book on the series and type out all the code. And uh, from there, we'd use the knowledge we gained from going through this book uh, to uh, write to the compiler for our own custom language. And um, now we're kind of being bootstrapped much further along in the process. We're still going to go through this book. I, I have the book and I still intend to read it, so we're still going to do that. But off stream, I'm also going to be following along with Bitwise, of course. So I'm going to get to see and follow along with the, the uh, implementation of the ION programming language from Pair. Uh, so that's really going to kind of <laughs> uh, speed, speed that process along. So I thought now would be a good time to introduce kind of the things I've had floating around uh, for a while in the back of my mind and some old text files on my laptop. <laughs> uh, uh, if, you've, uh, if you had a sharp eye, you might have noticed in the trailer um, for Risky Business a bit of an Easter egg. Uh, one of the things on the screen uh, on my um, my desktop screen in that video was um, some source code that uh, was f kind of prototyping a, a language to be, which is the language we're going to be implementing on the series. Uh, I didn't uh, explicitly ever mention this, but <laughs> it's in the video. So if you go back and watch the, the trailer for Risky Business, and you know you pause it and look at the source code that's being shown you might be able to spot an early incarnation of kind of what i was playing around with in my mind at the time but uh i have uh, i took a i took the time to i think it was a hello world example that i had in that easter egg kind of uh in the video but i took the time uh, now that Pear has started doing this and we're getting to see Ion get made, uh, I took the time to clean up that old Hello World file with what I kind of currently envision the language being, and I wrote some notes about kind of the, the idea that I have in mind for a language. So I want to go over that now just to show you guys what I intend to do for... Um, for my own series in terms of implementing a programming language. And you'll see that it's very similar in terms of um, what Pear is doing. Uh, it's really designed with the same philosophy, so I think it's going to end up being a very similar language to what he's designing. Uh, so I made some notes here about what I have in mind a C-like syntax, and by that I mean a Jai-like <laughs> syntax, Jonathan Blow's language. Uh, but I consider that to be a C-like syntax. So uh, basically the idea is to have a better assembly, which is what people in the real world consider C to be. <laughs> like C is a higher level language than assembly, but it's still very close to the machine, it pretty much maps directly to assembly. So people think of it as basically being like a better assembly. But uh, because of issues like undefined behavior, uh, you know, you can argue that the people who write the C spec <laughs> don't see C as a better assembly. They kind of see it differently. And uh, C kind of sucks. So it makes sense to have a language that is kind of a high-level assembler is what I like to call it. Um, 
and that's actually like a, a real term <laughs> it turns out like high level assembler uh, so for example uh, NASM and ASM is a popular assembler and it's considered a, a high level assembler apparently um, I don't know if they I guess they don't really have examples showing off why it would be considered such I don't know but uh, it says that high-level assemblers, assemblers typically provide instructions that directly assemble one-to-one -one into low-level machine code, as in any assembler, plus control statements such as if, while, repeat, until, for, and other enhancements, things like that. So um, that's similar to what I mean when I say high-level assembler, but uh, I'm thinking more of a language like C, uh, an actual compiled language. Uh, but a language that is in spirit, basically this. Oh, that's interesting, Risky5. Uh, he says he learned assembly with Randall Hyde's HLA, High Level Assembler. Uh, I am not familiar with that, but that's very interesting. The first assembly language I learned was Z80 because... Um, that's what the that's the processor that a TI eighty four plus calculator uses. Oh, interesting. And then, um, so basically, what we what we want to have is a language that is a high level assembler in spirit, but uh, technically it would be a compiled C like language. <laughs> That's true, uh, pseudonym73. Uh, I'm a bit young <laughs> to fall into that category, but uh, uh, TI-84 pluses, we're still using Z80s. Uh, I'm sure you can still buy them with Z80s. Uh, I know they have newer models, though. And a calculator was my, uh, a graphing calculator was my first experience with programming. So that's why I ended up going down that route. Oh, I see. So you wouldn't necessarily recommend the book from Randall Hyde's HLA. <laughs> Good to know. Um, uh, but basically the first kind of mental exercise that I want to do is if you think about an x86 assembler, uh, certain, I don't remember which syntax it is, but one of the syntaxes that for x86 assembly, um, it has instructions that infer the actual instruction based on the context. So, uh, for example, there are like a bunch of different specific move instructions, but you can just say like MOV, and based on the arguments, it figures out which actual one you mean. Uh, and I think that's a good place to start for developing a language if you want it to be better than assembly. Just list out the instructions of your instruction set architecture and then say, based on the context, how can we create a higher level instruction that can infer from its context which actual instruction you mean? Uh, so I literally listed out the um, all the instructions, pseudo instructions, and uh, assembly like directives for Risk Five, and um, I just grouped them and said, you know, how can we abstract this. So you need to have uh, constants and labels, and I didn't specify that, I just said that's a thing, right? 
And that kind of goes with these things because uh, these have to do uh, with like um, constants uh, in the sense of load upper immediate and add upper immediate to PC. These instructions, the, the reason these instructions exist is because immediates in uh, RISC-V have uh, only so many bits. They can only fit, <laughs> they can only pack so many bits into an instruction. So uh, kind of to get around that limitation, they have a few extra instructions to kind of deal with that quirk. And um, so I listed those under constants. And um, uh, the, the byte, half, word, d word, uh, those go along with um, having in your your executable, like in the data section or whatever, having um, certain width um, things, and you'd be passing, you know, constants to these. So that's kind of why I listed them here. Uh, then you have all the different variations of jumping, which is just a go-to, right? You just go to a label, and that you know that covers all these different instructions. Well, I guess technically you could say return to for ret. Uh, technically, that would be a return instruction too. So go to slash return <laughs> for all these uh, instructions. Uh, and then this is something that's different than um, C code, but if you want to, you know, there's all these different branches and uh, these are used both for like if statements, else sta statements, uh, else if they're used for looping, like do while, while, uh, for, you know, things like that. Well, I mean, indirect jumps are used sometimes too, or I mean, um, uh, unconditional jumps, but uh, you could just have a single branch instruction. And so I kind of listed out what that would be like. These right here, these are pseudo instructions. So they're not actual RISC-V instructions, but you could like use them in assembly code, for example. These are the actual instructions. Uh, and these comments here, uh, C style comments, uh, show kind of what I'm thinking for a language where you say like uh, branch A is B label. And what that does is it does a, a BEQ, which is a branch if equal, um, which compares registers, the, the two registries you pass it, and then it, it goes to, it jumps to the offset you pass it, which would be the label. So you could do all the different variations here. And I marked the ones that have uh, unsigned variants, I marked that in the actual comparison. Because if you're starting just with this exercise, this mental exercise, you don't have uh, variables yet. You don't have a type system, right? You're still just working with registers at this point. So. Um, if you're directly working with registries, you need to actually differentiate it in the instruction. So that's why I listed those like this here. Um, then you have various things. So like a load, uh, you would just say like x equals, uh, you know, pointer, and then here's the offset in C-like syntax. So uh, these these brackets are just indicating that the x equals is optional because uh, this this load could be in the middle of, of an expression, right? Like it doesn't have to be an assignment. Uh, it could be, you know, just a temporary in a larger expression. But uh, the idea here is it's just, you know, this is just the C syntax for a load. Right, where, <laughs> uh, you know, the pointer, uh, and then the what we think of as uh, array indexing is, you know, that's really a pointer operation. It's not actually an, an array operation. It's, it's pretty syntax for uh, adding an offset to a pointer and dereferencing the value 
and the dereference is the actual load, right? And again, I listed here that you would have to have different variants to handle the type because right now we still don't have a type system. We don't have variables. We just have registers, right? So if you just have a register and you're going to load something from memory, you need to specify the the type of the load. Uh, so that actually needs to be part of the the operation, so to speak. And I just listed it like this. Um, then you have stores, and it's the exact same thing. It's just flipped around, right? So, you know, the dereference is happen happening on the left side of the expression. Um, uh, if you keep going here, uh, you have addition uh, by an immediate, uh, you know, and it just it it goes on like this. One interesting thing is uh, we have like set less than immediate, and um, that's interesting because uh, it kind of maps to uh, a ternary operator in C without the else portion. portion. Um, unless it's unless I'm misunderstanding what SLTI does, which it could be the case. <laughs> I didn't bother to to look uh, uh, look up what it actually does. Just assuming from the name. Uh, it might just set like equal to one or set equal to zero, something like that. Um, but anyway, you just keep doing this exercise. Oh, Risky5 says it's correct. Thank you for uh, letting me know. Um, so then if it, in that case, we might end up having some sort of syntax like this in the, in the actual language. Uh, which is interesting because C doesn't really have that exact kind of construct, but I think it would make sense to have something like that then. Uh, one thing, this is the um, the shift right arithmetic, and uh, I use the triple um, the triple right angle bracket, which is what um, what D does. Oh, okay. It sets equals one or equals zero. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. I thought it might do that because you can only have three, um, like three things in an instruction, and these would this kind of construct would have four. So I was a little suspicious of this. I thought it might be sets equal to one or zero. So yeah, in that case, this this wouldn't be something that would end up in the language. But uh, you know, this was just a document I typed up without actually looking up what the things do. <laughs> uh, but yeah, this is like what D does for um, this type of shift. And uh, I don't think C has this. I think you can get it sometimes from doing this. But uh, I, in D, this is an explicit thing. Uh, if B is less than I, uh, So you're saying what it does is um, it does uh, if b is less than i return one otherwise zero I take it and by return I mean set it into the the a yeah so in that case um, you would just have an instruction. Um, so really what you would have is you would just take off this part, right? And then you'd say a equals this and this is, I mean this is what happens in um, comparisons anyway, like in C, kind of the conversion to a, a boolean. That's what this operation is doing. So. Like the actual syntax you put in a language would just be like this sort of thing. Uh, this part is bogus. <laughs> this part right here you wouldn't have in the language because, like I say, that was from me misunderstanding 
what the instruction does. Uh, and then the same applies right here. I did the same thing there. Um, but then uh, here's some things that didn't really map to uh, an instruction, and I think uh, they would be best served by directly uh, doing inline assembly. So that's another thing that I think the language should have. Uh, inline assembly. Oh, and I see I just blinked out. Uh, I am not... Oh, I'm maybe back. Uh, I apologize if I blinked out on you guys, but uh, I seem to be back. I'm watching OBS, so I apologize for the, the little blink out there. But um, yeah, we have... Um, I don't really know when fence instructions would get generated and um, whether it would make sense to have them in uh, like explicitly in the language or not. Uh, I, th I feel C minus minus, I've heard of it, but I don't know anything about it. Uh, So uh, ecall and ebreak, those ones I feel pretty confident that you don't really care about having in the language. You would just want to use inline assembly uh, CSR stuff. <clears throat> and again, these sorts of things are like very architecture dependent, and that's why I kind of say you don't want them in the language because you want your language to be not really tied to a specific architecture. You want it to be more general than that, even though the show is all about Risk Five, <laughs> and we are specifically going to only be like targeting Risk Five with our language. Uh, that doesn't mean we're not going to try to keep the language general, uh, because um, if you didn't try to keep the language general. Uh, it, it really would just be like, you know, assembly. Uh, one of the big benefits that C gives you is partability. Uh, and I've talked about this before, that it gives you partability not in the broad sense of the term, uh, but uh, it doesn't keep you tied down to an architecture very, very tightly. And um, that's actually a really big win. Historically, at least. You know, if Risk Five takes over the world and for the rest of time that's the only architecture we use, then that doesn't really matter anymore. But uh, uh, we're not going to build our language assuming that's going to happen, even though we we want that to happen. <laughs> um, so, um, but yeah, these. These are all pretty self-explanatory, um, and like I say, I think things that are pretty architecture dependent should be done through inline assembly. Uh, here's some more that are just um, pseudo instructions, and the same for things like this that are um, uh, assembly specific stuff. Uh, these are like directives for the assembler. Um, and I took out ones, I took out everything that, this is only RV32i that I listed. So these are only RV32i instructions. So for example, for the assembler directives, one of them is uh, option no RVC and another one option RVC. Those two are used to enable or disable uh, generation of compressed instructions, but we're not using the um like this document isn't dealing with anything other than just the base integer um instruction set so i didn't list those here uh moving on on we have some more and again most of these are pretty pretty basic stuff um and uh, at this point, we're we're looking through a lot of stuff that's um, 
actually just pseudo instructions. Um, but then uh, other than that, I show off here that we want kind of a Jai style syntax, Jonathan Blow's language. Um, I, men I mentioned procedures here that they would generate a global symbol, but I don't define what a what a procedure would actually be in this particular document. And I, I list a few other ones, a few other things that would be useful in a you know a bare bones. So the kind of the idea here kind of is you bootstrap the language in multiple steps. So rather than writing uh, the full language and then you know writing a compiler in C for the entire language the idea is to get out of C as quickly as possible so you make kind of a a high level assembly in the the more strict sense of the word where you have directly you you don't have variables you don't have a type system you directly refer to registers and it's just that the instructions are these more general form instructions uh, with the C style syntax. Um, and then from that kind of language, prototype language, uh, you go on to to write a compiler for a richer language and you, you incrementally build up your language that way. Um, so I have three documents that I put here with varying levels of detail. Uh, if we continue uh, just doing these thought experiments of kind of how a high-level assembly language should be built, uh, you want to further simplify the instruction set by introducing a type system. So in the previous document, you'll remember that there were a number of instructions that you had to specify the type. So some of them had a U stuck on the end. Uh, because they needed to know it was unsigned and like the loads and stores you had to stick the actual type like entire type uh, because it needs to know the width as well as whether it's signed or unsigned um, so you can reduce those instructions even further if you have a type system so if you have variables that have a type associated with them now you have the context to generate the appropriate instruction based on a, a single more abstract instruction. Uh, and so the general principle uh, principles we want to apply uh, to making this language richer are uh, kind of abstracting common code sequences, uh, abstracting registers with stack. So that's one of the big things that C kind of does that has proven to be a very useful abstraction is uh, registers are like an implement implementation detail that are swept that it's swept under the hood right so logically uh, your mental model can be that you just have a stack and a heap in memory and you know everything you're doing is operating on that you technically wouldn't need registers at all but in reality you're operating on registers and that's just like an optimization detail as far as the language is concerned uh, and that has a lot of impl uh, impl implications uh, i think i talked about some of the implications of this in a book club episode uh, where i was comparing uh, c versus assembly um, I talked about how if you're making a language um, and uh, you introduce like a type system and uh, procedures, um, I talk about how the arguments you pass to procedures, um, like having this type of structure where you, you pass arguments into a procedure it um, it abstracts away the calling convention. It uh, it does this 
bullet point right here, it abstracts common code sequences where the common code sequence is setting up the registers to do a, a function call and then doing the function call and returning you know, back from the function to wherever you were. Uh, all the boilerplate that goes into that, you know, you're following a, a convention, an, an ABI. So every time you do this, you do it in a certain way that's well-defined. So you might as well abstract that into a feature, a language feature. And uh, by having these variables and passing them in through an arbitrarily large, uh, you know, parameter list, uh, you never need to think about whether things are going in registers or the stack. It abstracts all that away from you. Uh, you only ever have to think about variables. Right, so that's uh, one of the big wins that they kind of get with C. And it's I think it's important if you're designing a language like this to take a lot of lessons from C because C has been so historically successful. Uh, I wouldn't consider that an accident. I'd say there are definitely a lot of rough points about the C language, but it did a lot right and it really hit the sweet spot in terms of what you want a system, a low level kind of systems programming language to be. Uh, I believe it C kind of hit the sweet spot. So it's it's useful to look at C and say, you know, a lot of the abstractions that C did more or less got it right. You know, it's kind of at the right level that the programmer wants to think at. So uh, it's useful looking at C and saying, you know, what did it do? Like, why does C have variables? Why does C have functions? You know, just think about it. What does it give you as a programmer? And uh, that's kind of how you arrive at some of these these details. Oh, and I also put this automate calling conventions slash ABI as a bullet point. Uh, like I say, that ties into this, and that's what uh, procedures are giving you. Uh, and the other thing is human readability. Uh, one of the big issues with assembly code is you can't really see the control flow. Uh, and that's one of the big deterrents to human readability. Uh, the other thing is, you know, it's just a small pool of uh, instructions, and it's just a giant list of those instructions in various permutations. Um, and, you know, you're referring to these cryptic register names instead of variable names. And, uh, you know, all these things come together to make it not a very readable language. Whereas C is a very readable language, at least at least to someone who knows C, <laughs> it's a very readable language. And so uh, human readability is an important point to consider. Uh, so if you introduce a type system just talking about uh, RV32I, uh, you have I8, I16, I32, U8, U16, U32, and of course void. You have pointers to these base types uh, and you have arrays, uh, fixed size arrays. And you might wonder why do you need arrays at all if you have pointers? And uh, this is an interesting question to think about because it, actual, it actually uh, introduces a little subtlety here. Um, you don't need dynamic arrays, you don't need variable length arrays or anything like that, but fixed size arrays where the, the size is known at compile time is something that you really don't have a good way to do unless you have them built into the language. Specifically what it does is uh, it puts something uh, like a number of elements of a certain type either in the data section, uh, the BSS section of the executable, or it could be like uh, allocated on the stack if it's a local. So that's actually um, something that you really don't have a good way to do. Like you can, you know, if you want to allocate something on the stack, you can use alloca, sure, uh, you know, but uh, that can be figured out for you at compile time. 
if it's a global, uh, there is really no equivalent at all. Uh, so you really need it for globals, uh, unless you want to just list out a bunch of, <laughs> you know, just have a big list of uh, variables and not have a good way to like index them and stuff like that. Um, but uh, it's really a feature that you kind of need in the language. And the other nice thing it gives you is uh, the size of operator. So you can have uh, size of on an array and it can tell you how many elements that fixed size array has. So that's kind of a nice thing too about uh, having fixed size arrays in the language. So that's the one single array type I would have in this language. Uh, and again, it's entirely for a practical language. It's not like uh, a D style array where you have, you know, uh, a dynamic array structure basically that has, you know, length and capacity and the actual contents of the array. Uh, you know, we're not worried about any of that sort of thing. <laughs> like, uh, it's not about convenience. It's not about kind of high level language features. It's purely about something that you can't represent cleanly in your language unless you have the feature. Like a dynamic array you don't need because you can just do a malloc. You know, you can just do, you know, request memory from the system and have a pointer to it. And, you know, if you want to have your own array structure, you can do like an SDB style <laughs> um, stretchy buffer, or, you know, you can just have a struct that has the the length stored in it as well as the the pointer. You know, you can do things of that nature. So you don't really need it built into the language if you want the language to be as small as possible. Uh, some things that you definitely want, structs and unions. Uh, I listed VA list and VA arg because uh, in C, these aren't really built into the language. They're built into like the, the standard library. And if you look at the actual definitions of them, they just are defined to be uh, referring to compiler built-ins, right? So rather than having nonsense like that, I say just make it a keyword built right into the language, right? Uh, same with Alica, uh, memcopy and memset. And you might wonder, why do we need these two as keywords? Uh, you don't necessarily need them as keywords, uh, but you need them, you need implementations of these like built into the the compiler for um, doing things like struct initializations and uh, like copying things around. Um, these things like in C, what happens is when you do certain things like that, it will generate these instructions to do them or not instructions, but I mean calls to these functions. Uh, and it provides them as like compiler built-ins. And um, it's a really janky system where, uh, like I think it was memset in pcalc, where we tried to define our own memset. And we you can do that, but then if you try to do link time optimization, it just, it, it breaks, <laughs> it doesn't work. So uh, clearly, there are some problems with that way of doing things. And I think, you know, just just build these right into the language then. That's a much better way to go about it. Um, and of course, you'd have the, the corresponding VA start, VA copy, VA end. I'm not saying that the way C does variat variatic arguments is necessarily the best way to do it. I haven't really thought about it. All I'm saying is you want the equivalent of these built into your language. Uh, alignment stuff, of course, too. Uh, procedures, at this point, now that you have a type system, you can say, you know, define how to do procedures in your language. Uh, I'm calling them procedures instead of functions because that's a more correct name. I think uh, Jonathan Blow is doing the same in his language. Uh, I'm not positive on that. But uh, it's the same kind of syntax that his language has, of course. 
And then you also want to have a no return uh, as well for something like uh, exit, for example, is a, uh, a function that, that doesn't return. So you want to have a way to do that in your language. These ones I'm not so sure about, but they fall under the category of um, abstracting common code sequences, and they're extremely common and used heavily in C. So when it comes to things that C has done right, you know, I don't hear anyone really arguing that these are things that are, you know, not necessary for the language. I think everyone appreciates them. But at the same time, if you want the language to be as small as possible, you technically don't need these constructs. So, you know, I could see that either way. I could see strong arguments either way. Uh, one thing that's a little bit different from C and maybe a little bit richer than C is some stuff. I was reading uh, the literate programming book by Donald Knuth. Um, I don't know if I can find the the book. Uh, this isn't a very, <laughs> uh, that's not the cover of the one I have, but, oh, they have it. Yeah, this is the book that I was reading. I have this book and um, just recently I was reading through it and uh, one of the it's it's like a collection of papers that Donald Knuth has done, or like the the first one isn't actually a paper; it's like a transcript of a speech he gave. Uh, but one of them was structure uh, structured programming with go to, I think is what it was called. It's like the second chapter in the book, and like I say, I believe this is a standalone paper that you could find and read if you're curious. Um, and he talks about a lot of interesting ideas in this in this chapter of this book that we still don't have today in our programming languages, uh, and it's kind of surprising to me. Um, and I just want to go over some of those ideas, and I think it would be interesting to put them in uh, our own programming language. Uh, where did I put... Uh, Oh, right. It's, I was looking at it on GitHub. So uh, I don't know how you pronounce this guy's name, but he's very famous in computer science. Uh, Dijkstra, um, the famous uh, go-to considered harmful paper. Uh, uh, that, that title was, I believe the story is that wasn't actually his title for the paper, but like the publisher wanted to get it out right away and someone just stuck that title on it <laughs> and it's such a sensationalist title and now everyone has these bike shed arguments about go to and everyone says like oh you shouldn't use go to and that's not what he was saying in that paper um and this chapter that uh Newth, uh, did uh in this book that i was reading was all about uh kind of the situation with go to and really the thing is what we need are very rich control flow structures in our language uh, but you don't want to get rid of go to either you you still there are still situations where you really do want to have go to uh, and that's part of what um, Newth was talking about in his book but he, he he approached it from both sides so he showed things where if you have better uh, control flow structures you can get rid of go-tos, and then he also showed situations where uh, you might still want to actually have go-tos. And uh, he references a lot of work. Um, he references C.T. Zahn, Peter Landon, Clinton Hoare, Nicholas Swerth, which is the guy that um, Pear is referencing a lot in his series, by the way, in the Bitwise series. Uh, he references old Johan Dahl, and then of course uh, Donald Newth himself. Um, I'm saying, you know, see the work of these people. 
Uh, Donald Newth's, like I say, the literate programming book is what I was reading this from, but he explicitly mentioned these, these people as having come up with these ideas. Uh, I haven't finished day two either, Kraepa. Uh I did some uh, off stream, just playing around with it on my laptop before he did uh, day three or day four. Uh, but uh, I didn't finish anything and I'm gonna be starting from scratch uh, on this stream. But uh, right now I'm not talking about uh, bitwise, I'm just going over some ideas I have myself for a programming language. But uh, we might not get into doing actual homework today. Uh, this is just kind of an introduction to my own doing the homework series. <laughs> but uh, I, I'm, I am going to be doing all the homework on stream. Uh, that's my intention. Um, so I, I listed some things here, if switch until slash try. And uh, when I say try, uh, I have an example here, and this he didn't call it try in the book. Uh, Donald Newth called it until, uh, and his example his examples weren't in C. Uh, I don't know what language they were in, like Elgol or Pascal, something you know, some language like that that I don't know, but it's easy enough to follow along. Uh, his statement was begin until, and oh, I'm doing it in D2, Risky5. Uh, I am also doing the thing in D, the assignments. Um, I Like I say, I played around with it a bit on my laptop, but I didn't finish anything, and I'm going to be starting from scratch here, but yeah, I'm going to be doing it in D, of course, uh, because D is awesome, so we're going to have some fun with D. But... Um, yeah, he called it until, and uh, he said this was C.T. Zahn's idea. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but that's the guy that like came up with this construct. And uh, he said Peter Landon came up with like the same sort of thing, and Clinton Horror, these people refined it. Uh, and he mentioned how they would have written the same kind of construct but uh, he said he liked this version better and he makes a good argument for it in the book so i want to go over what that sort of thing would be like so i call it try because it's very similar to exceptions in my opinion uh, but it's not exceptions that's a very important point to stress these aren't exceptions um, and uh, so i call it try you pass it a situation indicator list, which is what he calls it. And these are basically just label names. You list label names here, okay? And then you have code in here, and then your code, instead of saying go to, you say the label name. And when, when your program encounters that, what it's gonna do is it's gonna actually do a go to to the block of code for that situation. So for example, if you have situation zero in the situation indicator list, and then somewhere in your, your code block here, you say situation zero, then it's gonna do a go to to this block right here and execute that code. But it's just a go to under the hood, right? But the other neat thing is these situations aren't actually just labels. They also take a parameter list. So you can say, you basically, you call the label like a function and then the variable, the variables that you're passing to it from within this block, uh, they end up in this block. So it's like, uh, the closest thing I think of is like uh, anonymous functions, lambdas, uh, a closure. Uh, when you have like a capture of the, the um, what do you what do you call it like the outer scope that it's called in and you you capture the local variables it's kind of like that like you're uh you can think of this sort of like uh like a lambda and you know it takes in parameters and those end up like being usable within the scope 
but uh, again, it's it's not a lambda. <laughs> it's not an anonymous function. It's it's it it all just compiles down to a go to. So it's it's just a, a nice higher level syntax over go to basic basically. Uh, so you have these situation lists, and uh, that's the uh, the until idea from that book that I was reading. And like I say, it was from these people, <laughs> but Donald Nath was talking about it. Uh, and I think that's a very compelling idea. And he also suggests uh, combining it with looping. So uh, this is, uh, in my, I, I renamed it to try because in my opinion, it doesn't make sense to call this until because that suggests that it's a loop, right? Like until sounds like you're going to keep doing this thing until one of these situations occurs. But that's not what this does, right? This just says, try this code block, and then if one of these situations occurs, go to the corresponding code block. That's all this does. But then he also talks about loop until, and loop until is that type of until. It does uh, until you hit one of these situation situations in the list, keep looping this block. And then once you hit it, go to one of the the situations right uh and this was another interesting thing about the language uh i don't know what language like i say that he was using but uh it had loop as a keyword and so like uh loop while uh loop until loop while like this uh loop for and I like that syntax because I like having just a bare bones loop like this. Oh, nice. Karefa says he wrote stretchy buffers two different ways, both with C++ templates, uh, just to see uh, uh, what it would look like. Uh, let's take a look. I helped uh, Delix with his, he, he did an implementation of stretchy buffers. I've read over the uh, STB stretchy buffer code before, and I helped Delix implement uh, his equivalent, equivalent to that. Uh, so I'm pretty familiar with the, the kind of way that uh, Pear did it on stream. Uh, I wasn't actually planning on it, bothering to implement the, the stretchy buffer stuff myself uh, uh i was going to jump right into the the stuff after that but um okay so so you're taking the same approach to stretchy buffers uh where you have the length and capacity uh and i think this is this buff zero syntax uh, if I remember correctly, uh, STB doesn't actually have a structure at all for the header. Uh, it just has like macros. It's just, it's all macros. <laughs> they, he doesn't actually define a structure and there's no buff zero thing like this in his, but this is how, how Pear did it. Um, other than the, tem the template stuff, of course. Uh, but yeah, I'm not going to read over this in detail, but, uh, oh, and here's your second one. Okay. Okay. So this one you actually implemented with, uh, methods, whereas this one, you just had the, the structures of the header standalone and then, uh, the, the functions separate I see yeah very very interesting I'm not a I'm not a fan of C++ templates myself so <laughs> I can't say I'm I'm a fan of either style myself but good job nonetheless
So I like the idea of having a loop keyword because it gives you a placeholder. <laughs> uh, yeah, it gives you a placeholder for do while. Uh, do is kind of a stupid keyword. So uh, it makes sense loop while. And if you have loop, you can have an infinite loop keyword, which is very nice in my opinion. And C doesn't have a, an infinite loop keyword. You just do like for with nothing or like while true, you know. And the nice thing about doing this loop syntax is like, so you stick the while down here if you want to do a do while, but then if you want to do a while, you can say loop while condition, right? Just as one thing. And then the body goes here and loop four. So it's a very kind of consistent, all the different ways to loop all use the loop keyword and it's it's very consistent and nice. And this matches the structure of generic looping that Donald Newth talked about in the, in the book again. Um, it does have the slight downside that you have to type loop while instead of just while, but <laughs> uh, I like it personally. So I think I would go with something, some kind of thing like this for, for looping constructs. Uh, and then speaking of control flow, there are ideas from other languages that are very um, kind of fit right in to add to a language like this. Defer is defer from Jonathan Blow's language. It's the same as scope exit in D, which goes back to uh, Andre Alexandrescu's implementation. I don't remember what he called it, but he implemented the, uh, the scope stuff in C++ using like nasty template metaprogramming probably. <laughs> I don't remember the details of the implementation, but uh, he he i remember seeing the talk on it when he did that that must have been back in like 2011 2010 somewhere in there he did that it, he might have done that earlier than that and that's just when i saw it but i feel like it was around 2011 because i think it was during kind of that standard uh being yeah scoped that's what i'm talking about yeah but yeah, I remember when he did that. So I, I, I believe he's kind of the originator of this idea. Maybe it exists in other languages before before Andre did it. But I think of him as the, as far as I know, I think of him as kind of the originator of this idea. Um, the other thing is fall through. So I don't know if that would be the best name for it, but I think a, a switch statement should and of course you want switch that's a, a good control structure like i set up here if switch um i think breaking like having to type break in every case is the uh like the it's the wrong default uh you it should normally break and you you say fall through to make it fall through uh <laughs> And then uh, this is also, um, when I was at Acre, I had a course on um, Envy's language. We, we never ended up using that software. Um, um, uh, when I went, uh, they flew me out to Colorado, and uh, I went to this this company headquarters. They were just going through the rebranding at the time. Uh, they had just been bought out by Harris or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's in Boulder, Colorado, and so I flew out there. Um, the like I say, the company I was working for had me do this. So I didn't, you know, it was, it wasn't out of pocket. <laughs> the company paid for me to do this, but, uh, this is, um, the leading geospatial spatial analytic software, according to their, their marketing. Um, and like I say, we never actually ended up using the software <laughs> at, at, at the company, but they had me learn the language for, 
uh, extending the software to do like custom stuff. They have their own like DSL. Um, uh, I think it's called like IDL or something like that. Um, but uh, I got to learn it at the headquarters there of this company. And that was one thing that I liked about their custom language is they actually had this type of thing where they had a switch statement that doesn't break by default. Uh, and I thought that was really cool. That's just a, a random memory, but <laughs> that's one place where I've encountered that type of thing. And I, I think it's really nice. Uh, the other thing is labeled continue and, and break. So those are really nice too. Um, uh, one thing that I put here is also before I um, before I go on, I saw that Risky Five posted his. I want to take a quick look at his too. His stretchy buffer stuff. In D. Okay, so you really uh, stuck right to the. Um, how pair did it um you just did it in d so it's a it's a very faithful translation and that's really nice uh if i were to implement it in d i would have done the same thing i would have done a very faithful implementation just having the niceties of the d language to do it in um rather than going like crazy with with metaprogramming or, or things like that Oh, and uh, Kroifa mentions, have you thought about function returns with regard to error conditions? Uh, and a yes to the point that I think exceptions are stupid, tuples are too high level, and C, in my opinion, does it fine, other than Erno. Erno is really stupid. But just returning from a function is totally suitable. And if you need something like a tuple, as a user, like uh, uh, you know, someone writing like a an application for the desktop, um, you could just make a struct that has, you know, like a um, a void pointer and an error code in it, or something something to that nature, or even just doing like the buff zero trick, you know, just have you know allocate the space for the structure plus a little bit ahead of it for the error code. You know, do something like that. <laughs> I, I don't think you need anything special in the language for error handling. Also, Risky5 says uh, struct intern string, string. Oh, I see. So you're saying uh, you got rid of the intern string structure and just use these uh, built in strings. That's reasonable enough. But yeah, for my homework, I'm planning on uh, not bothering with the um, the stretchy buffer stuff and just going straight to the next assignment and just using D's built-in um, dynamic arrays. Yeah. Okay, uh, so moving on here, comments. Uh, oh, nice strong muffin. Yeah, I am. I am from Minnesota. I'm not as uh, north for north as you are, though. I'm like practically on the border with Iowa. <laughs> uh, if you know Mankato, that's like the closest big city. But yeah, nice to see another Minnesotan in chat. So uh, for comments, I want to have the um, like shell script style comments with the, the um, hash symbol, the pound symbol. <laughs> uh, 
And my reasoning for that is uh, I don't think we really need multi-line comments. It can be nice to have, but like if you want to mass comment stuff out, you should just have your editor support doing that for you anyway, being able to toggle between commented and non-commented. Um, and that limits the case where you really want multi-line comments to when you want to like comment something out in the middle of a line. Uh, so that's just a very minor inconvenience if you don't have multi-line comments. So I think just having this single line comment style is fine. It's a single character, which is nice. And not only that, but uh, it enables shebangs. Uh, oh, interesting. I'm not familiar with B5 businesses. I, is that pronounced like businesses? <laughs> Business? Uh, I'm I'm unfamiliar with that streamer. What do they um what do they do? But um being able to do the shebang is really nice because uh that comes for free. You don't support it in your compiler. As far as the compiler is concerned, it's just a comment if you have this syntax. In D, D supports this and they have to have like a special case that if the shebang is the first thing in the file. It's like that's legal syntax, but it's not the comment syntax. Whereas if it's the comment syntax, you don't need to do anything special because the compiler will just ignore it. But uh, what happens is when you try to run, when you mark the source code as executable, the source code file, and then you uh, try to run it from your shell, uh, what the shell actually does is it, it parses the, the start of the file to see if there's a shebang line. And if there is, it, it runs that program. It, it passes the file to that program to run it. Uh, that's how like the, the shebangs work in bash, for example. Uh, and, uh, that's the, the trick that DM, that, uh, RDMD uses in D. Uh, so rather than having a special case for it in the language, it's, it makes sense to just have this be the comment syntax. Uh, and that's a nice, you know, quality of life feature that you get for free by doing that. So, and it's a, it's a nice syntax for comments too, in my opinion. So might as well go that route instead of C style. Uh, and then some other stuff like enum, type def, constants, I think constants. <laughs> Uh, some of this stuff should be uh, really phase one, not uh, not phase two. Oh, he's he made handmade math. Okay. For some reason, I was thinking that was like uh, Zach Strange or someone someone else. I didn't I didn't realize that was uh, whoever this person is. <laughs> Ben Business. Okay. By the way, speaking of handmade math, I heard that uh, I didn't tune into the last um, stream that Delux did because uh, it was in Pear's time slot. So I watched Pear instead. But I heard that he maybe fixed a bug, like he found a bug and fixed it in handmade math maybe. Uh, I don't know. I should bug him because he's probably not going to push that. <laughs> he's probably not going to submit a pull request. Uh, I just have a I have a feeling I should bug him about that but yeah that's interesting I'll have to give him a follow um, I I think a module system I'm I kind of agree with pair that there should be a module system but I lean more towards the reason for having a module system being namespacing. Uh, to me, that's kind of like the primary advantage of a module system. Uh, but we both want that type of thing in our language, so <laughs> uh, that's all I'll say about that for now. Um, then I have yet another document here. So extensions, by that I mean extensions to RISC-V, like multiplication extension, for example, would mean you would implement these 
uh, operators. And um, basically what I think you want in the language is you want a certain uh, common ground of things that are useful across every like architecture that you'd ever want to you know target but um not too tied specifically to any one machine uh so things i listed here other than like the multiplication stuff um i128 and u128 um not particularly useful right now but i think looking forward d has these for example uh, they use it they use the sent keyword and you sent for those um, I just think it makes sense looking forward to have those even if they're they're not supported on hardware I know risk 5 is kind of pre-designed to support these types as well to support a 128 bit processor so yeah I, I think those make sense uh, f32 and f64 I think those are pretty standard for floating point types. Uh, no explicit support for like F80, which is the um, the floating point hardware, the old, I think it's like X87 or something. <laughs> That's in X86 processors for floating points and they have those like 80 bit floats. Uh, that's, that's an example of a feature that's in my opinion too, too specific to a machine. And it's also not uh, like anything you even use these days. Um, it's better to use like SIMD for floats or something like that. Um, so that's kind of like just baggage now these days. That hardware isn't even really relevant. And uh, like I say, it's it's very tied to a particular architecture. It's not widespread across architectures. So it makes sense to just have like F32, F64. And then of course, if you have floating point, you need to represent uh, not a numbers. You need to have float constants. Let me catch up on chat here. Uh, I'm pretty pumped about Bitwise. I am too. Uh, yeah, every one of us will come out <laughs> with their own language, exactly. Uh, it's the season of a thousand C-ish languages. Very, very true. Uh, C with arbitrary context, the way C++ uses this added to every function, and I will become a crazy person who clothes exclusively in his own language. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's basically the direction I'm going with risky business, is being a crazy person who codes exclusively in his own language. Uh, like the the plan for the series is to write our own language and then do all all of our tooling in that language, and that's like what uh, Pear is doing with Ion too, of course. So <laughs> uh, I think yeah, we're not alone in kind of just wanting to have our own language and build everything ourselves from our own language. I think that's kind of there's a there's a group of people that all feel that way definitely. Uh, Croifa says, I can't imagine ever needing an, an integer, <coughs> excuse me, uh, an integer with more than 64 bits other than for SIMD. Yeah, I can't either, but uh, apparently there are justifications for it. I've heard that there are certain uh, classes of applications, certain domains where <coughs> that sort of thing would actually be useful. But don't ask me what those domains are because I have no idea. Um, V128, V256, V512. I feel like these are kind of becoming the standard lengths for vector types. So uh, Risky5 actually sent me uh, this the um, spec uh, for uh, Risk5 with the vector extensions, like the latest vector extensions in in them. Um, because it wasn't published, I guess, like the source was for the the docs, but he built it from source and sent it to me. I want to read that on the series, but by the time I get to it, <laughs> it might be published. 
<laughs> I don't know because you know you know how it is with me in streaming. So uh, we'll see if I get to that in time or not. But uh, the um, I haven't looked too much at the vector in, in the instructions. I've seen them. Um, I've seen them on a talk on the Risk Five um, YouTube channel. And uh, I know it's in the RISC-V reader, but of course we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, or like an early draft of it is in the RISC-V reader. And like I say, uh, risky 5 sent me um, a more recent spec with like those defined in them, uh, the pro proposal listed out in the, in the spec. But I haven't read that yet, so... Uh, I won't say too much about what a language what should have for vector stuff right now, but I do think it should have like first class support for vectors. Uh, I think that's become a common enough thing that vectors should be built right into your language. Uh, bool, I'm not totally sure about. There are good reasons to have bool, like if you want to compare things against true, for example. Uh, it can be nice to have bools built right into the language, and for like library writers and stuff, it can be nice to have that built into the language. <clears throat> but it's also something that's not strictly necessary, so that one's questionable. Uh, no RVC for compressed instruction support. If you have compressed instruction support, you should default to generating compressed instructions, so you just need a thing to be able to disable it. So just having like a no RVC keyword for, and I mean, that's, that's an example of something that's architecture dependent though. So I guess you would want to, uh, have it be like a pragma, I guess, or something. Um, because, uh, like I don't, I want something more granular than just having like a compiler switch. I want to be able to like block off sections of code that I want to tell it to generate not compressed instructions. And um, like if you do it with inline assembly, I feel like that wouldn't play nice. I just feel like that would not turn out to be good, but you don't really want it to be a keyword of the language either because that ties it to risk five. Uh, so I don't know exactly how you go about that in the cleanest way. Uh, rectangular arrays, are another thing that D has, uh, and it's where it's again where you have um, uh, it's multi-dimensional arrays, but all the the array sizes are known at compile time. Of course, it's just a static array, a static multi-dimensional array, and uh, the idea is you lay it out contiguously. RVC as in risk five compressed. Um, they, uh, I, the no RBC is what they call the, the, the option, the option directive in, uh, assembly to turn it off. And then option RBC would turn it back on. At least that's, I, that's what I assume those do. <laughs> I guess I didn't actually check. I just assumed that it stood for compressed instructions. Uh, but um, the idea is you lay you lay this out contiguously in memory rather than having it be even though it's a multi-dimensional array rather than having it be like pointers to pointers you lay it out all contiguously in memory because that'll be much better for performance. Uh, D talks about D does this and in the page about arrays on the D website they mention that this is something uh, that um, is apparently like from Fortran or they say like Fortran programmers know that this is you know the way to go <laughs> but yeah that seems like a, a good idea also lazy I'm not sure about but it seems like it might be nice nice to have um, which just makes it not do eager evaluation that's something that D has offset of of course like I say shebang support comes for free if you have the um, the pound or the hash symbol being um, the uh, the comment symbol. 
Uh, and then, of course, we want to have like debuggers, profilers, uh, a literate programming system, uh, interactive data flow graph generator slash inspector. Uh, what this is referring to is I read an article recently, someone linked it on Twitter, that uh, Fabian uh, did. So if you go to links.risky.tv, Fabian Giesen, I believe. Uh, did that really take me here? Is it, How has like my DNS not propagated that? <laughs> uh, whatever. Anyway, uh, I know that link goes to the wiki. I know for a fact that link goes to the wiki. Uh, anyway, uh, if you go under miscellaneous here, I linked it in here. Uh, a whirlwind introduction to data flow graphs. Uh, So yeah, this is by Rigorous, and uh, he talks about all this stuff. And basically what it is, is uh, you analyze the performance of the program by uh, assuming some, you know, like a mental model of the machine, and then, um, you know, just graphing out what is going to be issued each cycle, basically. And... Uh, This is something that I feel like you could automate this. Like, why can't you automate this? Like, if you have assembly code, you could, and and you know the appropriate things about the machine on how it, you know, issues instructions and such, how many cycles instructions take, so on and so forth. You know, if you have a processor like the Boom Risk Five processor, for example, something that's out of order, uh, and s s things like that data flow graphs become a very useful thing for reasoning about performance and this blog post shows you how to do that basically but he talks about like writing the data flow graph out on paper and it's like well in terms of the number of iterations like you should be able to just highlight some code and say for the loop the loops in this thing you know like just run this code so many iterations right like simulate the code running so many iterations, uh, like, you know, expand it out that many, unroll it that many iterations, and then just graph it, right? Just graph the structure of, you know, how those instructions get issued, you know, and like how it all ties together. Uh, that could totally, in my opinion, be automated. I feel like it could at least. And it would be nice to have a tool where, like I say, you just highlight some code, maybe type in how many iterations to expand, and it just pops up a graph showing you this, and you can start reasoning about your performance. You know, I feel like that would be a very useful thing to have, and it seems like a thing you could potentially do, <laughs> have a tool actually do this for you. So I think that's a really good idea for a, a tool, you know, tool chain for making programming better than it is today. Um, another thing is interactive program manipulation system. This is an idea that I had before I read uh, the chapter I was reading that I told you guys about from Donald Knuth's book, but this is the name that Donald Knuth calls it, and he suggests that you should have the same kind of thing. And that research was being done on this kind of thing but we still don't have this kind of thing <laughs> in actual programming languages. So I'm kind of wondering what happened to that idea. Was it, did it turn out to just be a failed idea? I feel like it's, it shouldn't be a failed idea. I feel like this is just a thing that never made it made mainstream and it should be in my opinion. So the idea is instead of having optimization happen in the compiler, you have a very simpler, a very simple compiler that doesn't do optimization. Like it doesn't do an optimization pass. It just, you know, translates pretty much one to one what you type in the code to uh, machine code. And what you do instead is you have a interactive program manipulation system 
that allows you to do transformations to your source code at the source level. Uh, and he talks about, Donald Newth talks about having it some way, uh, you know, keep a record of changes that have been made, you know, so like here's the, you know, the simple version that we verified to work, you know, uh, that's documented, but then here's the, you know, optimized code that we generated with the help of an interactive program manipulation system. Like, if your language maps close enough to assembly that you can write, and if you have inline assembly, that you can write very, you know, optimized code by hand, then it doesn't really need to be done by hand. It can kind of be done metaprogramming style in the way that metaprogramming is done in C, like what um, Pear did, for example, on one of the streams, where he generated a bunch of case statements instead of typing them by hand. And the way he did that is, you know, he he literally just, you know, opened up like a Python REPL and used Python to generate the case statements and then copied and pasted it into his code. Well, you know, you could have a tool that is like hooked up with your profiler, you know, and like, you know, you can try applying different transformations to your code dynamically and like it profiles it for you and you know shows you the data flow graphs shows you the assembly output you know like how is this going to generate assemble assembly differently uh what are the timings uh what does the data flow graph look like you know and you interactively work with this thing to generate better code uh i think that would be better than just an automatic optimizer and it keeps the language simpler and offloads that work to a tool DBG uh, or DBJ. Who is uh, who is DBJ? Uh, I know that's a big name, <laughs> which is, uh, but I I don't know who that is off the top of my head. DBJ. Uh, but yeah, Donald Newth was. Of course, it's not gonna. programming oh Daniel J Bernstein okay yeah I've heard of him he's done like a lot of crypto crypto work right he's a crypto guy I think but anyway yeah that's something that I think is the right way to go for doing optimization uh, it makes it you know you're really working directly with a tool. You're not just automating it. You really know what's going on better. Uh, and it gives you much more power over the optimizations that are being done. Uh, it just seems like an all around great idea. Okay, yeah, he made QMail and does InfoSec related stuff. But yeah, um, Donald Newth talked about wanting a system like this. He talked about talking to at least one other person who also wanted something like this. Like I say, before I even read that chapter of the book, this is something that I wanted to do. Like this just seems like the direction tool tooling for programming should head. And that's what I want to experiment with in my, my tool chain development. That's kind of like when I say that I want to build tool chains. Like my big idea for a risky business is not to build tool chains like they've already been built. My idea is to push the envelope forward and have tools that are better than what we have today. And this is an example of the kind of thing that I'm thinking of. And of course, to do this kind of work, you need to be like an actual ex expert <laughs> with with what you're doing here. And that's why I'm learning all this stuff before we get into actually doing tool chain work. And I, I also listed like a package manager, for example. Uh, but yeah, that's that gives you a pretty detailed overview of the kind of, you know, that's a brain dump of everything I've been thinking about, like for what I want out of a language. I call it Hula, by the way, because it starts from the idea of having a high level assembler 
if you abbreviate that, that's HLA. That you know, you're just one character away from that being a nice English word, <laughs> you know, that uh, makes a good programming language name. So I call it I call it Hula, the language, uh, and that's my my idea. Okay, so here. And like I say, a very a very early version of this file was shown in the trailer for Risky Business. So if you if you haven't seen uh, the trailer for Risky Business, or if you have seen it but you didn't catch this, you might want to go back and watch that. Oh, interesting. He was quoting Newth too, so I guess he read the same thing I read. <laughs> but yeah. Um, if you go back and watch the Risky Business trailer, you can actually catch in in there, uh, like um, a very early version of this code on a um, this example code. It's not real code because there's no Hula implementation, but <laughs> uh, a very oh death of optimizing compilers. Interesting. That might be worth a worth a look. But um. This is the like this is the same file, but I've just edited it to the point that it's very different from back then, because you know I started with these ideas a long time ago, like before I started doing risky business, and it's been developing off stream. Like the ideas have been brewing in my mind all this time, and so this is the latest uh, incarnation. So uh, here you see it has the shebang line, so you can directly run the file like it's a script. Uh, but it's definitely not a script. It's a, a very low-level program. Uh, we have some constants. Uh, entry. So here what I've done, this is like I think start address is what it's called in D. But last I checked, that didn't actually do anything. <laughs> like, it didn't actually set the start address, I believe, last time I was playing around with it. Because uh, if you set it to something other than s underscore start, which is the default that it ends up using, uh, it, it, like, it doesn't pass it to the linker. You have to actually pass it to the linker yourself to get it to properly do that. But uh, here we're just saying it's built into the language that you have an entry block. So this is like a procedure without a signature. There's no signature. And what you have in the parentheses is the symbol name, right? So the symbol is underscore start, you know, and like if you pass it off to a linker, uh, it would tell it to, to uh, set this as the entry point in the linker, right? And in here, so within the block of code that is the body of the entry point, uh, it's just like a normal function, uh, except it doesn't have like the normal function prolog. Uh, it doesn't generate a stack for you. It doesn't, um, uh, you know, do like a return at the end or anything like that. But um, uh, what we have here is I define a few variables, and uh, these, of course, are gonna be put in registry, it's not on the stack. Um, and it's also hinted what registers they should go in. Uh, this is one example of an optimization that you would actually have built into the, the language. I think the compiler does need to do um, register allocation. It does need to do smart uh, allocation of registries. Uh, I think it should do like this as smart as you can get it register allocation. But like that's the only optimization I would want the, the compiler to do pretty much. Um, but you have an assembly keyword. And what happens here is you have, it's like a for loop, sort of, where you have the semicolons delimiting the different parts of it. And there's three parts. All right, uh, see you later, Croefa. So the first part right here is um, this is your your input, like variables that you're passing in to registers within the the uh, 
assembly block. Then you have outputs. So here you're saying uh, RDI needs to go into arc C, RSI needs to go into arc V, and if your compiler is smart about register allocation, arc C should be in RDI to begin with, arc V should be RSI to begin with. So this won't actually generate any instructions, right? Because it's already gonna, you know, be set up right. Um, then at the end you have your clobbers list. So this is similar to, you know, this this is all very similar to how it's done in um, like GNU assembler syntax, for example. But uh, it's an it's a much nicer syntax. And one important thing to note here is that these symbols like RDI, RSI, these aren't quoted, right? Like these are treated as like part of the language, but they're not defined by the language. Because like this is x86-64 assembly in this example, rather than RISC-V assembly. But um, the thing that's interesting here is the idea is when you encounter, when you're parsing the language, uh, you need to have a, an assembler. And the assembler syntax is defined on the platform level. So the platform backend defines what the assembler syntax is for your, you know, your target of choice, right? And so part of that is specifying symbols like RDI and RSI. But these symbols are not visible to arbitrary arbitrary code. They're only visible within the parentheses of an ASM statement and within the um, the curly brackets. And I don't know how reasonable this would be to actually implement in practice because I haven't implemented a compiler yet, but watching pair and following along with the development of ION, we're very going to, we're very quickly going to learn uh, how practical this example syntax is. But I really want something like this where your your assembly code like once you get into this block, it stops parsing it as um, as hula code, and it starts parsing it as assembly code. Okay, so this is straight up assembly code. It's not quoted. There's like there's nothing, you know. It's as if it's the language you're in, but just within this block, just within an assembly block. And like I say, I don't know how reasonable it is to actually implement something like this in a, in a compiler, but I would really like a syntax like this. I think a syntax like this would be really nice because every, every inline assembler I've ever used has subpar syntax. The best one I've seen is the D assembler, but it still uses strings. Like it, all this stuff would still need to be quoted. And, uh, D has like um, uh, token strings, and I don't know if it's valid to use token strings technically in an assembly block. I feel like it should be, but uh, you know maybe something like that is the way to go. But this is like my dream syntax for what it should be like. So uh, going, continuing with reading the entry, uh, now we're in assembly code, and so. I'm saying here we're doing Intel syntax with no prefix. Uh, we zero out RBP using the, an exclusive R. We pop the first thing on the stack into RDI. Uh, we move RSP to RSI. We uh, uh, align RSP on a 16-byte boundary. And then that's all we need to do in assembly. So we can get out of the inline assembly. And then we can call the main function with argc and argv, which you see here, I, I set our RDI to a, you know something that was on the stack originally. I set RSI to what the stack pointer was at one point. Uh, those values, uh, it knows that those go into argc and argv because of the output list right here, right? This is what this is saying. RDI is argc, RSI is argv, okay? 
So now when you do main arc C and arc V, those have the values you set from this assembly code, right? And then the return value is going to be the result from main. And uh, we're doing uh, type inference here because pair is going to be doing that. And unless it's like super complicated, if it's really simple to do this, which it probably should be because you should know the type on the right hand side, uh, it seems like that's a, a nice enough feature that you might as well have it. Um, but that's, that's questionable too. If you want to keep things as simple as possible, you wouldn't have type inference like this. But I, you know, that's one of the features that's that's kind of on the fence. Uh, and then, you know, once you get the return value from main, you exit with the return value. Uh, an important thing to note here is we didn't define main yet. We didn't define exit yet. So just like um, just like Paris language, um, you can you can define in any order. But again, uh, that's not strictly necessary. So if it's uh, particularly you know easier to do it the way C does it, then maybe we would go that route instead. Okay, uh, for main, uh, yeah. Again, we see the syntax here. Uh, in C, arc v is uh, an array of pointers to characters. But uh, it doesn't make sense to have it be an array, in my opinion, because uh, it's not known at compile time. And like I say, we only want fixed size arrays that are known at compile time. Uh, so I just have it a pointer to pointer. OK. And it returns an i32. So we start out by saying hello is hello world string. And the a string literal in this language would be a array to characters. So if you wanted to type that out explicitly, uh, it would be like this. U8 would be the type for a character. Uh, and then uh, instead of a pointer, you just have uh, brackets like that. And if you remember in my um, my documents, I said you needed to have a constant right here, right, for a, a fixed size array. But you can do this because uh, it's the same as with C. Uh, you can do this because, um, so like uh, foo equals bar, right, because the size of the string literal is known at compile time. So rather than having to do the, you know, count the characters by hand and put the number in here, uh, actually this would be four because these are these are C style strings. They're null delimited, right? Null terminated, I mean. Uh, there's no reason, to, in the same way, in the same vein as type inference, there is no reason to have to manually count the characters of your string literal you should be able to just do this because it's known on the right hand side. But otherwise, the the syntax, if you uh, wanted to do it un um, explicitly, you would just put the number in here, right? Something like that. In this case, it would be four. So those uh, that's how a, a string literal is represented in this language. Um, and that gives you the nice property that you can just set hello equal to the string. And then if you want to get the length of it, and you can do this in C too, by the way, if you do the same thing where you create an array of characters and set it equal to a string literal, you can do this exact same thing where you can do size of uh, hello and because it's an array, it, it has the size information, it has the number of characters, and that includes the, the null terminator, right? And because it includes the null terminator, you subtract one from it, right? And that gives you hello length, the length of the, the hello string. Uh, now we're going to loop, and the reason we're looping 
in this hello world is because the right system call can return less than um, like it can write less than the number of bytes you requested so technically if you want to do a proper uh, <laughs> like a proper write uh, the technical um, technically correct way you're supposed to do it is actually loop um, so uh, we loop and this is just an infinite loop and uh, which by the way tends to be the way to go if you want to do performance like high performance code a good place to start I've heard is to start with an infinite loop uh, I actually didn't start with an infinite infinite loop for this code but it naturally it naturally fell out of just logically you know looking through the code and saying you know how do I write this to do the least amount of work possible and an, an, an infinite loop naturally arose um, so ret the return value of the write call uh, we do std out file no and like I say we define that constant up here um, so we do the write this call with std out hello hello length uh, if ret is greater than or equal to zero, uh, that means that uh, it succeeded. So uh, you add the, the the number of bytes you uh, wrote to the hello pointer. So you advance the pointer, the number of bytes you wrote, uh, and then uh, you subtract that number from the length, right? And if the length uh, is zero, then you return zero from main because you're done, right? That means you wrote the entire string. But if length is not zero, then that means you did a partial write. So you need to continue. But if ret is not greater than or equal to zero, uh, if the ret return value is negative, you got a uh, error no value, a negative error no value, which is what the syscalls return. This isn't the the wrapper. This isn't the glibc wrapper. This is just a raw write system call. Uh, and you'll see it's defined down here, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, so if you got an error no value, uh, you're here now in the code. And so you say, uh, if it's if it's e again, E interrupt or E would block any of those cases you can recover from. Uh, you just try to write again in those cases. So if it's any of those, uh, then um, this case doesn't get this if statement doesn't get taken. You hit the end of the loop and it, it'll loop back and go again, right? But if it's uh, if it's not any of those, if it's not one of those three then it's an error no value that you can't recover from. So you just I just exit with the return code. So that's the main program, okay? And again, this is just a hello world, a simple hello world. So here's the exit syscall. Uh, I specify that instead of putting a return value in the place you would put a return value, I put no return because it doesn't return. So rather than having like an attribute specifier or something fancy like that, like why would you put a a proper return value if it doesn't return? You might as well just put the type of the return as no return. Uh, I feel like that makes sense. So that, that's how I did that. So the type is no return for the return value because it doesn't return. Um, but it takes the status in as an integer. I, that should actually be i32. That's a that's a bug. <laughs> that should be i32. But um, Here's a comment saying what the actual syscall we're doing is exit group. Uh, you figure this out by just reading the man, pa man page for exit, and it'll, it'll tell you that uh, 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 the glibc wrapper, for example, actually will do exit group under the hood. So that's what you should use instead. So um, again, you have an ASM statement. You're saying we're passing 231 into RAX, that's the, the number, the system call number for um, exit group on x86-64. You're passing status into RDI. You're not 
passing anything out because it doesn't return. And then, you know, this is the stuff it, it clobbers as usual. Um, and then you just do the syscall. And again, the body of the ASM statement uh, is actual assembly code. It's not like this isn't a keyword in the language. This is a keyword in the inline assembly language. Uh, and again, I don't know if this is actually viable to <laughs> to have this kind of syntax where the inline assembly is interwoven with your normal language and have the parsing dynamically switch back and forth between the two. But that's my dream syntax. Okay. And then finally we have write and it's the same sort of thing. It takes the usual parameters that you would, you know, the usual function signature that write would have. I mentioned here that we don't have signed or const in this language. So that's a difference in the signature from the, the traditional signature. Uh, I take it from that comment. I wrote this comment a long time ago. So I take it from that comment that some of these would be const or are signed <laughs> in the in the traditional. Uh, although in this language, we do have signed in the sense that it's baked directly into the types. I think maybe when I wrote this comment, I was thinking about having it not be directly baked into the types at all and just not having signed and having it expressed with the operators instead. But uh, I ended up deciding it makes sense to have it baked into the types. So that's the direction we went there. Um, so here's your result. Uh, you do the ASM statement, same as before. The syscall number is four. You know, you pass the file descriptor, the buff, and the count into the appropriate registers. The result variable that we have up here is going to be uh, RAX. So RAX needs to go into result. Again, if your compiler is smart, it should uh, have result be RAX uh, in the first place. Uh, and then, um, like, uh, I mean, REX is set to four when you do the system call, but like what the compiler should generate is like nothing here. And then RAX, when it does return result, it should just do, you know, like make sure RAX is the result and then, you know, do the return with, uh, with that um, our result because RAX is the the return value in the the ABI by the way so uh, these are the clobbers of course and again you learn these clobbers based on uh, the the ABI you look up the ABI for x8664 and see what it clobbers it clobbers RCX R11 and memory and you're also touching RAX in this um, this code, right? So you're you're clobbering that too, and then you just do this syscall and return the result. So that's a complete example of what this language looks like. the The emphasis here is building applications from scratch, like I do with pcalc. Like this is in this language that that's the default of how you build an application. There's no standard library. There's no like wrappers over the syscalls or anything like that. You define everything yourself, including the entry point, right? It's designed to just build an application from scratch. And the, you know, this is an example of what such an application would look like, you know, and it's only, it's only like 55 lines for a hello world. So considering that this is defining everything from scratch, I'd say that's pretty good. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, I also put in here just for fun, uh, hello.s. So this is an assembly file and it's risk five assembly. Uh, and I just wrote this earlier. Um, but this is what I think the risk five equivalent of hello.hula should compile to on a, uh, risk five Linux system. So it's the same thing as the hello.hula. It's just translated to 
uh, assembly and you'll see that it maps really one to one. You know, some bits are changed because the code we were just looking at was for x86-64 and this code is RISC-V, right? So it's different in that regard. <laughs> but uh, you'll see that the actual structure of the program we just looked at maps very closely to what you have here. So in assembly, you know, in the actual um, the actual output of a compiler wouldn't give you these niceties. I don't think you would. I don't think you would bother having your compiler output this pretty of assembly. But <laughs> this is like writing it from hand, which is what I did. I just wrote this from hand. Um, so we define e again, uh, e interrupts, e would block, std out, file no just like we did in the, the hula code. Uh, then we have our entry points, and like this is the boilerplate in assembly to set up your, your entry point. You see that the symbol, it's start, which was specified in the, the parentheses of the entry keyword. And then here's the actual code. Um, this code right here is the body of, of start. Uh, it zeroes out the frame pointer. This is the same as the zeroing out the base pointer, RBP, in the x86-64 code. Uh, and I did it the same way using an exclusive R, which I think is still going to be the best way to zero a register out in RISC-V. Uh, there are other ways you can do it, but I feel like that's still going to be the best way. Uh, load word uh, A0 from sp and then add i sp sp4 what this is doing is a pop it's popping into a0 so instead of popping into rdi we're popping into a0 that's going to be the first argument to main right so we're popping an integer off the stack into main when your program is loaded it puts the uh, arc c as the first argument on the stack so by popping that off the stack into a0 you're making argc the first argument to main. Uh, and then of course to do the pop you don't just load the word you also add add four to advance the the stack pointer uh, by four. That's that's doing the actual popping. Uh, then we move the stack pointer into a1 that's the second argument to main. So that's going to be the um, arg, uh, arg v. Uh, because now, <clears throat> now that we've moved uh, past the arc C, uh, the stack, the next thing on the stack is arc V. So we're pointing to arc V, and that's what you pass into main, the pointer to uh, the argument list. Uh, then you align the stack to a 16 byte boundary, same as you do on x86, 64. Then you call main and then you call exit. Uh, and uh, I do it this way because uh, a0 is going to be the return value of main. Ah, uh, Risky5 says the canonical zeroing should be add i dst x0 0. Okay, that's good to know. Uh, I know that's a way, you, I, I knew that was a way you could do it, but I thought that uh, the exclusive or would probably be the the way to go for zeroing it, but uh, I'm glad to know that I was wrong. <laughs> so that's useful to know. Um, so the return value from main is a0, and then a0 is the first argument to exit, so you don't need to do anything special between these two calls. You just call main and then call exit. Uh, here we have the main symbol defined, so we define the, the symbol and make a label for it. Uh, yeah, the ABI says you need to um, align, like you need to, the stack needs to be aligned on a 16 byte boundary. So to create the, the stack frame for main, like the smallest unit you can allocate is 16 bytes and the stack grows down, which is why this is a, a minus, a negative 16. So uh, this uh, sets up enough space on the stack for a single variable. 
and uh, we store uh, RA, which is the return address. Uh, uh, we store uh, 12, the SP offset by 12. So what that's saying is, um, you know, you go to um, the top of what you just allocated. And uh, the reason it's 12 is because uh, it's four bytes for the integer. And so if you take four off of 16, that means the offset needs to be 12. So that's going to that's gonna put it right up. The integer goes right up to the end of what you allocated. And then um, you do a load upper immediate uh, into A1 and uh, the high part of the string one label and add immediate A1, A1, uh, the low part of string one. And I saw this sequence. Uh, I was looking through the RISC-V reader when I wrote this code. Uh, to re I was referencing the RISC-V reader. And I saw this. They did a hello world example. Not not like mine, but they did a, a hello world example of their own. And um, this is how they loaded the string. Uh, and I don't know if it's really necessary uh, to do it this way. This, this is um, uh, for if the address is far away because they break it into a high part and a low part. Like I said before about how with the, the limited space of um, immediates, you, you end up with these extra instructions for things like this. Um, but yeah, that's how you get the, um, the address of the string into A1. So um, I'm putting the address of string one and I define string one down here. So here's the read-only data section. Uh, line to a four byte boundary, string one, here's the label, here's the string. So hello world. And uh, it's uh, this this um, null terminates as well. Just like in C. So um, uh, this gets the address of that string into A1. And then uh, I do a load immediate and that's a pseudo instruction. I think it does what uh, Risky Five is talking about of doing an add i destination x zero and then the immediate right here, right? I believe that's what li expands to. Uh, so li a two and fourteen, and that's the length of the string. Uh, in the in the um, the hula code, we did size of the string minus one, but I I went ahead and constant folded that to 14 <laughs> by hand. Uh, I don't know if you'd actually, if you don't want your compiler to do any optimization, you might not actually constant fold that, but um, it seems like a, a reasonable optimization to do too, so I don't know. Uh, anyway, then we have a label. Uh, and I just called it one. You need you need a lot of labels in assembly code because the way you do control flow is all through jumping around. So you need labels. So um, this is uh, this label represents the start of the loop. Uh, we load immediate a zero with std out file number, uh, which again is a constant we defined. And then we call write. So what we did is we set up the arguments to write being a zero. The first argument is the file descriptor. The second argument, a one, is a pointer to the string, the, the buffer. Uh, a two, the third argument, is the length that we're trying to write. So uh, that set up the um, the arguments, and then we called the the write function. Then we do the branch if greater than or equal to zero. Uh, A0 to uh, 2F, that means label two looking forward. That's something I wondered about on Risky Business, what the 1B was about, why it was a B on the end. I was confused about that, but I learned that today when I was writing this. Uh, F is for looking forward, and B is for looking backward. So 
branch greater than or equal to zero a zero to two f means label two scanning forward uh, add a one a one a zero so that's adding uh, a zero is right now the return value from right so that's the number of bytes we wrote and we're adding it to the pointer uh, the hello pointer and then we do a sub a2 a0 so we're sub subtracting the number we wrote from the the length just like we did in the hula code it's exactly the same uh, then we branch up equals 0 a2 to 3f and uh, that's saying um, if your uh, your string is empty then go to to 3f which we'll get to in a bit but again that's just like in the um, the um, hula code we had an if um, if the hello length is zero then do something right and the do something part is the the three label three that we'll get to in a bit down here so uh, next we have jump to label one. So that was the continue statement in our code. So again, it translates straightforwardly. Uh, it jumps back to the beginning of the loop, right? One B means label one scanning backwards. So it jumps back here. Uh, then we have, uh, if we get to this case here, um, or if we get to this case here, uh, so uh, the the label two is if you are um, if a zero is greater than or equal to zero, which means um, your uh, maybe that should be backwards. I might that might be a bug uh, here we're saying if it's greater than or equal to zero so that's the case where you um, you you successfully like the right succeeded if it's greater than or equal to zero if it's less than zero you want to jump to two so that 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 case needed to be inverted that's a bug <laughs> um, but like I say I typed this by hand um, and I didn't, you know, they, I didn't test this or anything. Um, so label two, this is the case that handles the errors. So the first thing you do is you load the immediate E again into a temporary, and then you branch if they're equal, if A0 and T0. So if the, if the um, return value from right is E again, and you'll notice in my constants, I defined them. They these aren't the values that Erno define. You know that 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 they're normally defined to. These are the negation of what they're normally defined to, because that's what the Linux kernel returns, which is much saner than having the Erno mechanism that C has. So um, you load this into T zero, and then you compare it with the return value from the right. If they're equal, that means it returned the error E again. So we continue by uh, jumping to label one again. And uh, if you remember, this was if, and then three different statements that were being tested and did together. So how do you do that in assembly, right? You just do the first one and then if the branch doesn't get taken, you try another branch with the, the next condition and you just go down the line like that. So next you load the interrupt, e interrupt value into temp zero. And again, you test for equality. And if it is equal, you jump back to, to continue the loop. Uh, and finally you test e would block. And this is an example where you could optimize if you were using an optimizing compiler but we're saying we're not going to have an optimizing compiler. So I didn't optimize this out. 
but this test is actually exactly the same as this test because uh, e would block is defined to be the same value as e again. So that's actually redundant. You don't need to do this test at all. But I left it in because, like I say, we're not optimizing the code. Uh, so uh, you do those three tests, and if you still haven't looped back, that means at this point you have an error no value that you can't recover again, so you call exit. And like I say, the, the A0 is already set up to be the the value you pass into exit. All right, uh, Risky5, good night. Uh, I'm going to end streaming pretty soon as well and sleep. So I'm just going to go a little bit longer to finish up describing this program, and then I'll, I'll end it for the night. So uh, you call exit, and um, let me check out your thing here. That reminds me that I missed something. Is this what I missed? I remember you linked. Yeah, so that's what I missed before. Uh, your circuit simulator is almost usable. You're finishing a RISC-V circuit and will be exportable to FPGA Verilog. That is very exciting. And here we see it in action. That is looking very nice. I am very excited by that. Thank you for uh, updating us on the uh, progress. All right. Um, so where were we? So yeah, we just looked over the, the case two. Case three, the label three, that's what happens uh, if you end up uh, if you end up getting to the point where the length is zero, which means you wrote everything successfully. So if you wrote everything su successfully, you jump to label three here, and uh, here we're um, we are um, restoring the. Um, the return address we saved on the stack, we're getting rid of the stack space we allocated. We zero out a zero, and again, I did this the non-canonical way because I thought this would be the, the appropriate way to do it. Uh, and then we do a return. So when we do a return, that's, a, that's again, it's a pseudo instruction for a jump. And so that's jumping to um, the value in um, RA, the RA register. So that's actually jumping to um, all the way back into the start after we called main. So it jumps to this line right here when you do that ret. Uh, and that uh, yeah, so here's the label three and here's that ret. So that jumped to exit, and that happens to be the next thing I defined in this file. So um, again, call is a, a pseudo instruction too. It, it, again, it's a jump. <laughs> so when you when you call exit, what you're doing is you're you're saving the this um, the stack pointer plus one into a um, onto this uh, uh, the the stack. Or I mean, um, into a register. You're saving it into another register, and then you're um, you're jumping to uh, the label you you said you wanted to jump to. So, for example, exit. Uh, you're jumping here. We don't need to do the stack frame stuff because. Um, this is going to just exit out anyway. So um, A7, I had to uh, I had to actually figure this out looking at the, the Linux port SARS code and looking at um, the patch submission um, that Palmer made to the Linux kernel. 
uh, to figure out the calling convention because it's not actually documented properly anywhere, um, at least that I could find. So uh, I had to figure it out the hard way. But A7 is the the syscall number in the the Linux kernel conven calling convention for risk risk five. And then these these numbers are different too from the x86 64. These are the generic assembly. Um, syscall numbers, which again I found by looking in the, the Linux source um, source code for the RISC-V parts. And the, the RISC-V part, it doesn't define any syscall numbers, it just includes the generic one. So you look at the generic one and that's where you find these numbers. But this is the number for exit group and the generic one. So you put that in A7, which is the syscall number, and then you do a S call because um, uh, Linux runs as the supervisor. So this is going to um, interrupt uh, and then the kernel will uh, execute the uh, system call in the uh, supervisor level. And then eventually return back to your program. And um, the other thing, well, not in the case of exit, but <laughs> normally it would. And uh, the other thing to note is it doesn't, um, at least as far as I could tell reading the, the source code, um, the only thing that the Linux system call implementation on RISC-V clobbers is memory. It, it doesn't clobber any registers. So for a write example, write for example, you don't need to um, you don't need to save the return address. Like that's what I was saying earlier about the call saving a uh, a register. It's the stack pointer plus one saved into the RA register, um, and so you don't need to save the RA register on the stack for write. I believe. I haven't tested it, but I believe that's the case because I, uh, the kernel should only uh, clobber memory. It shouldn't clobber registers. Um, but you'll see the right implementation. You just put 64 in A7. And again, the, um, the arguments to the system call are A0 through A6. So, um, uh, you don't need um, to move anything around. You don't need to shuffle anything around because those are the the same values that you would use for a normal function, which is nice. <laughs> so you just do a single, uh, you know, set the syscall number and then do the the s call instruction, and then finally you return from the the right call. And like I say, the value in RA shouldn't have been clobbered by the system call. So you can just do return and it'll uh, jump back to wherever you did the right. And then uh, after that, it's just like I say, we already looked over this, the, the string for hello world in the read-only data section of the executable. And that is a hello world in assembly and the idea that hopefully was expressed here is this mapped like one to one to the um the um hula code the only difference that we spotted was uh this was a bug that's supposed to be uh less than zero for that and that's a common thing in c code versus assembly code sometimes the constructs in c you need to flip the comparison. Like it need, the comparison needs to be the opposite of what it is in C uh, in assembly. That's a very common thing. So um, that's not surprising that that needs to be inverted from what it was in the Hula code. But more, it, it more or less follows the, the same structure as the Hula code. So you see that Hula is very much designed to translate straight down to assembly. It's really just like a high-level assembler. That's the idea. Um, 
So I know that was a long-winded thing, but like I say, I wanted to introduce this now because Pear has started on his language. So it seemed like the appropriate point to announce that, you know, this is the ideas I have for a custom language for my own series. And like I say, we're going to be doing the exercises on this series that you're watching right now, the Bitwise homework series. We're going to be doing the exercises. So we're going to implement the ION language and learning from that is going to directly translate into me implementing the Hula language. So probably while I'm implementing, you know, following along with, um, with Bitwise, I'm going to be in parallel developing the Hula language. As I, you know, go along with him implementing ION, it's just a matter of, you know, <laughs> uh, instead of implementing it verbatim and copying ION from what he's doing, you know, just taking the concepts and writing our own code to compile Hula instead of ION, you know. That's kind of the plan here for the implementation of Hula, which is why, like I say, I'm bringing it up now because uh, as we do these exercises, we're probably going to be developing Hula. Which I didn't expect would happen for a long time. I thought we were a very, you know, long ways away from doing that. But uh, because Pear is doing this project, uh, the Bitwise project, uh, it's accelerating risky business. And now, uh, you know, we're directly benefiting from it with being able to work on Hula right away from what we learned from ION in the Bitwise stuff. Anyway, that's all I wanted to cover today. So that's just an introduction to what Pear is doing. You know, uh, if you like Risky Business, definitely check out Bitwise. It's, this, it's very similar to Risky Business, and it's by a very experienced, uh, great programmer and developer. <laughs> so... Uh, definitely check it out. It's awesome stuff. And I'm going to be doing the homework on my own show. So, um, yeah, and developing Hula. That's everything I wanted to say. And uh, next time we'll jump into the homework. So thanks for tuning in, and uh, I'll see you guys next time. Stay risky, everyone. <laughs>